Welcome back everybody, I'm Jake the Scary Story Guy and I am wearing shorts beneath the camera, I call this the Fetterman. And for this first video of 2024, I had a choice to make. Do I make a top 10 list for the year that was 2023 or do I put on some pants and go to a theater and watch Night Swim? And guys, I'm sorry, that movie looks so fucking stupid, I can't. So a top 10 list it is, I gotta be honest guys, 2023 was a year where I felt way more invested in my bottom 10 list. I saw so many movies where I was just like, damn. <laughs> The horror landscape feels pretty bleak right now. So I ranted, I got it out of my system, I feel better, I feel cleansed. And now I return to you with a little New Year's sunshine in my soul. But I do have one disclaimer to make for this upcoming video, which is that 2023 was a bleak enough year for the genre that I have included a couple films on this list that I don't think everyone would classify first and foremost as horror. My rule of thumb for this will be if I can explain why I'm classifying this as a horror movie in two sentences or less, I'll count it. So if you watch my list and you see a movie and you think to yourself, Jake, what's that movie doing on here? First of all, thank you for watching. I I'm so honored that you would choose to spend your time with me. What's your name? So I can consider it for my firstborn child someday. But also, fuck off. Make your own list. And without further ado, coming in at number 10 is a movie that came out all the way back at the very beginning of last year that I just barely got around to, which is called Infinity Pool. This film was directed by David Cronenberg's son, Brandon, whose previous film, Possessor, was very good and was actually the second movie I ever reviewed on this channel. And Infinity Pool is, you can tell it's cut from the same cloth as sort of this near futuristic, surrealist body horror. And the basic premise is that a married couple is on an island vacation, they're involved in an accident, and and that leads to them discovering some pretty dark things about the island's native population. And I don't want to give away more than that, but this is definitely a must watch for anyone who's into like the, the weirder side of this genre. We've got a couple excellent performances from Alexander Skarsgård and Mia Goth, who is quickly becoming a Hall of Fame horror movie actress for me. And yeah, I'd say that not everything about Infinity Pool ultimately comes together in exactly the way I, I wanted it to or expected it to, but it is a very competently made and entertaining film that left me thinking for long afterwards about what it was trying to say. Number nine on my list is a movie that I've already reviewed earlier in the year. So in lieu of telling you what I thought about it, I'll simply leave my review in the description and then I'll tell you instead something fucking crazy that happened to me when I went to go see Saw X. It's a reasonably empty showing. I'm sitting in the middle of the back row and in walks these three adults with, it must have been a five or six year old child and they sit on the end of my row. Now for those of you familiar with the Saw franchise, this may strike you as a questionable parenting decision, but I wasn't going to say anything until until it became apparent that these people plan to distract this child by just propping a phone up in front of him and playing videos at full volume, like the entire movie. And so the movie started, a few minutes go by, people are looking back like, what is that noise? But nobody's actually doing anything. And I, I just can't abide this. So I just kind of walk over to him like, hey, are you guys serious? This is so loud. And they're like, well, it's not as loud as he's gonna be if he starts fussing. To which I replied, well, no shit. He's like five. Why would you bring him to this movie? They told me to mind my business. I told them the loud videos were making it all of our business and I'm sure the management would agree with me. I'm gonna get the manager. I know I would have felt like a Karen if I wasn't so right. Anyway, so they turn off the phone. A few minutes later in the movie, someone gets their eyeballs sucked out through their head. And this kid, who could have seen this coming, starts crying. So they pick this kid up by the arm and like dangling him, just drag him out of the theater. And one of them turns back to me on their way out and says, this is your fault. And I think that on Honestly, might be the most outrageous behavior I've ever seen from people in public, but you know, ultimately they left and the movie was really quite good. Coming in at number eight, another sequel to a well-known horror franchise, Evil Dead Rise. This was indisputably my favorite of the Evil Dead movies. It's not the highest bar to clear for me. I mostly think they're just okay, but Evil Dead Rise was definitely the best of the bunch. And for me, I think the thing that really raised the stakes of this film compared to the rest of the franchise is that you actually care about these characters. Most Evil Dead stuff happens to a group of fairly unlikable stone or college kids. This happens to a straight up family, like with young kids. So it does feel like the stakes are raised a bit. The look of the zombie demons definitely benefits, I think, from more modern makeup artistry and technology. And I do want to give a special shout out to the performance of Alyssa Sutherland, who's obviously having a really fun time with this. One of the more memorable antagonists I've seen in a horror movie in quite some time. Number seven, and to me, this is either a horror comedy or a comedy horror, depending on your own personal uh, neuroses, but I'm giving this spot to Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid. Now, I have to be honest, at the beginning of the year, looking at the, you know, upcoming landscape of horror movies, I did expect this to be higher on my year-end list. With Hereditary and Midsummer, Ari Aster released two of my favorite horror movies of the 21st century. Two of the best, I dare say. And so there was understandably a lot of buzz about his third feature film, a three-hour-long odyssey starring one of the greatest actors of our generation, Joaquin Phoenix. And I think my ultimate takeaway from Bo is Afraid is that 
I really liked it. I never want to see it again. Again, I did a 10 minute review of this. I'll link it below because this is a movie that just really defies easy description. It's equal parts hilarious and bizarre. And I'm not making this up. I think it might have been the most singular movie going experience of my life. I've just never seen a theater react like this to something. Everyone was just bowled over to the point where the movie ends and the credits are rolling. And keep in mind, this was three hours long and everyone's still just kind of sitting there like, what the hell? Do we just go? It may not hold up as well as an at-home viewing experience where you're free to like pause it or scroll through your phone or whatever, just because a theater demands more immersion from you that this movie might benefit from, but it's really good and you should watch it. Number six, a movie that I never reviewed on this channel, and I view that as my personal greatest failure of 2023, the Amazon original horror movie, Totally Killer. This is a movie about a teenage girl who lives in a town where there were these legendary Halloween murders that took place a few decades prior. But when someone close to her is murdered by a copycat on Halloween, she ends up going back in time to try to stop the original murders before they start. And this is definitely a comedy horror movie. It's got a really similar tone to the original Scream, actually. And man, I just had an enormously good time with this. It feels like the kind of premise that might be stale, right? You know, oh, uh, time travel, 80s nostalgia, and, and high school slashers. How original. And I don't know how else to say it. I thought they nailed this. The humor, especially, was just so on point. The main girl is very uh, woke, as they say. And so when she gets catapulted back to the 80s, she sees how politically incorrect everything is. Her reactions to it are just, I, I don't know. The movie's really good and is my biggest surprise of the year. Coming in at number five, I thought it would be good. I hoped it would be good. It was really good. I'm talking about Kenneth Branagh's A Haunting in Venice. Branagh has sort of made a personal project of directing and starring in these old Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot adaptations. And I've got to be honest, I like the idea of these movies more than I have historically liked the actual movies. Like I'll hear there's a new one coming out and I'll get pumped, but then I see it and I'm never like, oh wow, I loved that. But while they all center around grisly murders, A Haunting in Venice is the first one to really incorporate themes and imagery for a horror movie, and I thought it was easily the best of the bunch. It's the most crisp and meticulously crafted murder mystery I've seen in quite some time. It does a great job of glorifying the beauty of the city of Venice, which by the way, I'm going to in a few months, never been, so this movie got me excited for that. But yeah, this is just one of the more like rock solid films of the year. I just don't really have anything bad to say about it. Number four, the best horror sequel of the year, hands down, Scream 6. And I can't believe I'm saying this because I really quite like the first Scream film, but I think this is probably the best film in the franchise. And the reason for that, I think, is that this is the first movie in the franchise that feels less like a comedy horror movie and more like it's just a straight up slasher movie. This is kind of a weird comparison, but I grew up on Harry Potter, so, so f*** it. You know how Harry Potter, it seems like it's a kid series for the first few books, and then the end of Goblet of Fire happens, and it's Voldemort's back, and Cedric's dead, and the graveyard, and it's like, oh, Wow, that got dark. That's what this feels like. Because historically, the, the villain of these movies, Ghostface, is just kind of a dumbass. He's not that hard to get away from. He's, he's constantly tripping over shit. Like, if you get killed by him, it's kind of like, that's your fault. But in this movie, Ghostface is actually really menacing. Like, he seems bigger and stronger and meaner and more capable. And there's actually some scary parts of this movie, genuinely. And you just can't say that about any other Scream film. And due to recent controversies, it does appear like this franchise is basically dead in the water. Scream 7 is all but not happening at this point. So if it had to end, I'm glad it ended on this one. Number three, not really a horror movie, but horror adjacent enough that I'm putting it here. Godzilla minus one. And the reason I'm putting it here is if you Google, like, what's the highest grossing horror series of all time, Godzilla will often come up at number one. I mean, these are just classic monster movies. I think the American adaptations haven't always been great, but ultimately, Godzilla is the most iconic movie monster of all time. And you've probably already heard this, word of mouth on this movie has been insane, but forget about horror. Godzilla Minus One is one of the best movies of the year, full stop. This takes place in Japan, immediate aftermath of World War II, and there's, for a monster movie, there's just a shocking amount of like thoughtfulness and tenderness about what that post-war period was like for the Japanese people. This works so well as both a monster movie and a historical drama. And I mean, it's not scary, but it's definitely deserving of my number three spot on this list. Number two, in my view, this is unquestionably the best pure horror movie of the year. Talk to me. This was directed by a couple of brothers from Australia. It's their first feature length film ever. And uh, damn, this was everything I want from a horror movie. It was fresh and well-made and genuinely scary in a lot of parts, which is just not something I could say about a lot of movies I saw this year. Talk to me is about a group of teenagers who figure out a way to become kind of demonically possessed. And the answer to the obvious question, well, why would they want to do that? Is that in this movie, getting possessed feels basically as pleasurable as being on drugs. So the kids basically turn getting possessed into this party game. They're like filming it on their phones and everything. And I, I don't know what to say other than you should see it and these movies 
movie rules. It manages to somehow both be a thoughtful metaphor for addiction and also just be scary as hell. Finally, we come to the top spot on this list. I just saw it and you're going to be saying to yourself, Jake, is that really a horror movie? Playing a little fast and loose with definitions here. I don't care. I loved it. I want to talk about it. Dream scenario. Nicolas Cage plays a professor, just a regular Joe, kind of unassuming, socially awkward dude, who all of a sudden starts appearing in everyone's dreams. Like, everyone is just dreaming about this guy. And you might think that sounds funny or, or whimsical or whatever, and it is, until these dreams start to take a really dark turn. And this movie, you know, online is often listed as a horror hybrid. There's definitely a lot of horror imagery going on here. But I, I think, to me, this is one of the best explorations I've ever seen of the horror that is getting cancelled. I think we're largely past the point now where idiots will say, oh, cancel culture is not a real thing. Of course it is. We've all seen it. It's horrific. Let's define it as the internet's tendency to bring consequences down on someone that are way out of proportion to their offense, or to their perceived offense. We don't talk about this much, but the human mind is simply not equipped to have hatred directed at it from millions and millions of people. Because evolutionarily, our brains are like, must fit in with the tribe, right? To be exiled from the tribe is death. And so psychologically speaking, there's really not much worse than feeling like you've been exiled, not just from your own tribe, but from the entire world. And you know, maybe in like an incredibly rare case, people will deserve that to some extent, but the internet just has a way of bringing that kind of wrath down on people for relatively minor infractions. Or in the case of this movie, something that's not actually a behavioral infraction at all. And Nicolas Cage is phenomenal at taking us through what that emotional devastation is like. Dream Scenario is funny, it's sad, it's thought-provoking, it's, it's timely, it's genuinely a bit creepy at times, and it is my favorite horror-ish movie of 2023. And with that, I wish you all a happy new year. Let us hope to get more of these kinds of movies in the year ahead and not so much of the dreck we've predominantly been getting. And in the meantime, Thank you for watching this video, and here's hoping you survive to see the next one.